as a former radio journalist, and I, and I was. I was the news director at WASHFM in Washington, D.C. And uh, we're going to talk about what it's like to communicate like a journalist without the spin. That's right. There was a time, and I was, uh, I actually graduated, my degree is in journalism. And, and as such, there was a time when journalism was not perceived as spin. It was perceived instead as being the place you could go or the profession you could practice without bias. I had a uh, prof, uh, Bill Drenton, who told me, first off, the thing the guy told me is, you will never make it in radio. I just want you to know. For one, you don't have the pipes. And we're going to talk about this a little bit later. And for two, he questioned whether or not it was actually possible for someone in my position to actually, well, convey a message powerfully. Because Bill Drenton had the voice of God. He did. I'll tell you, having him as a professor was actually very intimidating because he had one of those sets of pipes that just went down to the basement. And not only that, when he shared something, it was authoritative, it was powerful. Now, that was the beauty of journalism in the 70s. Yeah, the 70s. Wow, how sad is that? But in the 70s, journalism, and, and the thing that Drenton pounded into us time and time again, was no spin. There is no spin in journalism. We do not spin things. In fact, you used to get your, your papers that you turned in all marked up every time you used an adjective. Unless you defended where that adjective came from, you darn well better be sure that it's going to get you in trouble. And indeed, when you look at where we are now versus where we were then, adjectives today rule the day. We describe everyone and everything in a predictive fashion. And we also go through the process of trying to deal with the whole notion of we can describe this better than you can. You know, a simple adjective like, well, let's say, icky. Yeah, there's a simple adjective for you, icky. Now, my idea of icky and your idea of icky are two radically different things. We've got Eduardo on the call, and, and Eduardo is has his own version of icky, that the moment I said that, he was like, oh, icky. He had his own vision. Chris, by contrast, had a completely different vision, as did Luann. Everybody's got their own vision when you use an adjective. Our job, when we are trying to communicate with our peers, with our management, is to try and do this and get into a reduced spin area. Now, reduced spin, notice I didn't say without the spin. That's kind of hyperbole in and of itself. Saying that we can do anything and totally get rid of something that is so endemic and systemic to the practice, it's kind of hard, especially when 90% of our time, according to the Project Management Institute, 90% of our time as project managers is spent in communications. 90% of our time is spent in communications in one form or another. So our objective today is to make sure that we're doing this with, well, some deliverables. We're gonna sign off today and my target is to hit the Q&A at about 12, 12 Eastern time. That's right, 12, 12 Eastern time. Now, if you're wondering, um, if you're wondering about, uh, Carl, why 12, 12? That's when I'm going to shut up. We'll still have a little time for Q&A and so forth. And I do want to make sure you get your whole PDU out of this deal. I want to make sure you get all that. But by that time, by 12, 12 today, these are the things you're going to walk away with. And this goes to the first thing you should know. As a journalist, you start at the top. Where are you going? What is the headline 
so to speak. What's the headline? A lot of us treat meetings like mystery novels. Yeah, we'll have a meeting and we'll go, I'm getting there. Hang on. No. Bad behavior. You want to be a good communicator? You want to be an effective communicator? First thing you need to do is tell people where they're going up front. Give them some sense of anticipation. Give them that sense that they are going to get something of value and that, frankly, they should be looking for the nuggets that get them in that direction. This is where we're going. This is where we're going over the course of our time together. By the way, if you notice that I always point over there, that's because that's where my big screen is that has our presentation on. So uh, if you see me glancing over that way or pointing over that way, it's because that's where my presentation happens to be housed. But what are we going to do? We're going to do all of these things. And you'll note on the third bullet, I already mentioned adjectives as being the bane of our existence. Adjectives are also monstrous opportunities because communication is a two-way street. Other people use adjectives, and they do it a lot. This is where we're going. And, oh, what's wrong with that bullet? We'll talk about that a little later on as well. Now, I do want to invite you, however, to say, hey, Carl, shut up. Um, I need you to talk about this, or I'm looking down the laundry list of what's there. It's not exactly what I was hoping for. Fine. I can shift gears in a heartbeat and still get done by 1212. I can, really. So if you want to take me off track, if you want to run me down some rabbit hole, I'm good for that. I really am. The place to do that is the chat. The place to do that is the chat. You drop something in chat, we're in, uh, we're in really good shape together. Just go ahead and put it in the chat. And it, if I see it there, and I will try to keep one eye peeled, but if I see it in there, I will be more than happy to bounce in your direction and address whatever question, concern, or, you know, the real reason I'm here is for blah, blah, blah. Fine. I'll try and fill that void. It's a cheap and free consulting all within the next hour all within the next hour. So, how did we get here? Well, we get here by starting with the end in mind. We start here with the inverted pyramid. Inverted pyramid is a basic concept of journalism, and it's kind of cool because we will talk about it in some depth as we go through all of this. And the whole idea of the inverted pyramid owes itself to Johannes Gutenberg. That's right. Gutenberg Bible. You remember that guy. Um, but anyhow, Gutenberg is the one who actually got us where we needed to be in terms of being good communicators. Carl, uh, excuse me, wasn't that like the 1400s? Kind of doesn't apply in 2023. Well, actually it does. It does apply in 2023. And the reason being is because Gutenberg had a limited amount of type and he knew that some people wouldn't get the whole message. So what Gutenberg did, he pioneered this and it has now become the standard. Even in the AP style guide, it's still there. Yeah, but you start at the top. You start up here with the big news and you make it really big. And I mean, the big news is whatever's really going on. What's happening? What do people need to know? If you get struck down by a bolt of lightning in the next 20 minutes, in the course of a meeting, all of a sudden, sap, gone. Did you get your message across? Well, the reality is you should have. Should have gotten at least the headline. The headline and the major points that you were going to cover. Oh, wait a minute, wait a minute, wait a minute. Didn't you just do that when you said, where are we going from here? Yeah, we all should. We should make that a standard of when we're communicating with others. I love my son. My eldest son, Adam, is a paleontologist. He's a scientist. He's a researcher. He's 
by the way, every parent loves to say this. He's Dr. Pritchard. And uh, Dr. Pritchard is kind of a funny guy when it comes to phone calls and voicemail. Phone calls and voicemail? Yeah, communications. Kind of a funny, quirky kind of guy when it comes to communications. Because if he calls you and he gets your voicemail, hi, this is Luann. I'm sorry I can't come to the phone right now. Uh, he'll hang up. He'll hang up immediately. And then what he'll do is he'll jot himself a few notes. He does because he knows he's got to be succinct about his message. He knows that after 30 seconds, you're not listening to the message. You're going, how long does this go on? We've all gotten those messages where you're, you're, you're in total disbelief because you've gotten the message and, and you've gotten the phone call where they're going, hi, oh, yeah, I didn't expect to get your voicemail. Uh, wow, this is, um, <laughs> it would have been nice to talk to you in person. But since I've got your voicemail, what I really called about was I, I wanted to let you know, and, and it was Ted that brought this up to me earlier, uh, that, oh, oh, it just warned me that I've only got 15 seconds left. I'll finish this on a second voicemail. Yeah, shoot those people, would you please? Absolutely. It's unbelievable. No, Adam will hang up the phone, make a few notes about what he wanted to cover, make sure that he can convey it in 30 seconds, then he'll call you back and leave a voicemail. Wow. The inverted pyramid. The top stuff first. The big stuff first. The stuff is if you're going to get cut off on a voicemail. That's the stuff that goes first. It goes to the very top of the inverted pyramid. The big stuff first. Details, little stuff as you move on. That's supposed to be how journalist, journalism ran. Now, however, some of you have the uh, clickbait syndrome. You'll be sitting on Facebook, you'll be checking out what's going on with your peers, and you'll see some piece of clickbait that is absolutely, positively irresistible. You know, this man picked his nose for 55 years. Find out why. Okay, that's too bizarre. Click. And then it'll say 17 stories of medical conditions that, and you'll be like, no, 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 I didn't want, want 17. I wanted the one story about the nose picker. That was all I wanted. Please. What does that do for you as a communicator? As the receiver or the recipient in that, that communications exchange, you are angry. You are upset. You are not getting what you came there to get. That's the person we should never be. So what if they're only in your call or on your meeting for five minutes? They should have gotten something of value. Mm -hmm. Big time, starting at the top. Starting at the top. And start with the finish so that you can say, here's my case. My old boss, Ed, went into his office for a meeting. And he, I said, Ed, got a little PowerPoint here. I just want to share with you because what I think is important is you understand how crucial this particular relationship is to our organization. And he said, what do you want, Carl? And I said, well, I'm going to get to that. I've got, I've got about 10 slides that I just want to walk through with you. And he goes, no, what do you want? This meeting goes well. What do you want? I said, what do I want? I want another 200 grand to run the at and account. That's it? That's what you're here for? And I said, yeah. Do you need it? Well, yeah. Okay. We're done then. There, I just gave you back 20 minutes of your life. Ed got it. Ed figured it out. He knew what was going on. He understood the notion of the inverted pyramid. Get to the point for crying out loud. And it's what we should do. Anytime you're writing an email, anytime you're on a phone call, anytime you're running a meeting, I don't care. It all goes back to the inverted pyramid, the classic style of journalism. We start at the top and we work our way down. And it all starts with Johannes Gutenberg. Yeah. Where did we get here? Now think about this. When Gutenberg was printing out the Bible, it was movable type. And if you've never seen movable type, 
it is little pieces of wood covered with a piece of lead that is shaped out in the form of a letter. And the whole idea of movable type was that you could spell things out and then run the paper over top of it with ink and peel the paper off and you would have the image that you so desired. You would have the information you so desired. We got here by virtual movable type, which doesn't even exist now, which somehow people have taken to say, you know what, that gives me liberty to babble. It does. It gives us liberty. To, oh, my gosh. You know, I don't need to count the number of pages because it only takes up eight meg. Oh, my gosh. If it only takes up eight meg, it could run 100 pages. No, 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 no we should still be thinking like we're working with movable type. Big stuff up top, little stuff further down. The whole idea being is that, and this is what editors used to do. But let's just talk about this. This is an old copy of the New York Times. Mm -hmm. Austria formally declares war. So, but as you look at this, the New York Times, when they're layout editors back in the day, we're working from a concept of inverted pyramid journalism. What they were able to do was they figured out how many column inches they had to a page. And they looked down an article that you submitted, that you slaved over, and you did in the inverted pyramid style. And they'd go, okay, let's see. Uh, we told him he had eight column inches to film, and we've only got six available. So let's get a ruler, back it off two inches, snip. And they would literally just cut and paste. Oh, wow. Cut and paste. Yeah, this is where that comes from. They used to just cut and paste. They'd take whatever you had written and they would cut and paste. Now, if you had written this with saving the best till last, you were hosed. Yeah, this was not a good day to be you. And the reason it's not a good day to be you is because, quite frankly, you put yourself in a position where, well, you're losing some of the best data if you saved it for the bitter end. If, by contrast, you did the inverted pyramid, you came out a winner. Now, let's, let's take a look at one, shall we? This is out of that same New York Times. Now, even if you cut it all the way back, and I do mean all the way back. If you just took off, say, in the first column, you cut it off at war fever at capital. Did you learn anything just from those two paragraphs? Austrian emperor to take command at Vienna headquarters, war fever at capital. Oh, wow. Yeah, you actually do know something. They're looking at war. And the Austrian emperor is taking, taking the lead. Go down one more, and it's like, oh my gosh, crowds cheer at outbreak of hostilities and demonstrate friendly embassies. They find out more, and it's big news. Notice that it's all big news, and it gets to be lesser and lesser and lesser news as we go down. It's like France is scared. I don't care. France is scared. I don't care. If that happens to be the last line on that whole first column and we cut it off there, the fact that France is scared, that almost smacks of modern journalism. And that is the fact that they, they love to get you a little frightened, get you a little nervous. That's what happens. And as you look at what's written here, I shall look at what goes on. The whole idea of inverted pyramid is at least get to the point early so that if somebody comes in with the hook, and you've all seen those classic vaudevillian skits where somebody just comes in with a hook and drags somebody off stage. Yeah. Well, we have a modern version of the hook. And that is the timekeeper at a meeting. Because they'll go, yeah, I'm, I'm really sorry about this, Assad, but uh, we got to move on to the next topic. But, but, but if he did invert a pyramid, you're the one who's able to say, no problem, understood. If by contrast, you were saving the best till last, 
you're not doing anybody any favors. Also, it's important to, to recognize, and let me just back up a second. Look at that New York Times. Ah, holy smokes. That is just big. It's just data rich. It is just nothing but text, text, and more text. In today's society, we have a new problem when it comes to this. And that is this. If you're wondering what that creature is in the middle of your screen, that would be a gnat. Yeah, that's a gnat. And that is our current attention span. We have the attention span of that creature. Gnats do not have an attention span. They really don't. The attention span of a gnat is a great, great metaphor. And the reason being is because you look at this and it's what we've got to battle. Anytime we're in a communications event, we've got to fight that. It was, I, I have to tell you, being in radio was a wonderful experience for setting me up for all this. And the reason I say that is because we had to end on time. Had to. Yeah. Particularly uh, uh, one, one station where I worked before I got to wash, our um, noontime event, the newscast started at 10 till noon, and it had to end at noon. Had to end at noon, just like we're going to end at 12, 12 today. It's like we're going to end at 12, 12. And it had to end at noon. And the reason it had to end at noon was because at the stroke of noon, the second hand stroke of noon, Paul Harvey, news and comment, was going to be on. And you had to back time everything to land on top of Paul Harvey. You had to be ready to go. It's... Uh, 12 o'clock, time for Paul Harvey. Paul Harvey! And it was like, yes, nailed it. And you would love that. It was, it was a wonderful thing. Now, think about how many meetings you go to when somebody says, hey, I just need to cover one more thing. And all that's running through your head at that point is don't want one more thing. I thought we were done. I was reading the agenda. We were down to the last item. I thought we were done. By the way, that's why I ask you, if you have any questions or you want to you know, get something personal resolved in all this, that's why I tell you to put it in the chat. It's because between now and 12, 12, I got plenty of time to either make up time or cut off time. I can do my own little inverted pyramid and keep you my customer satisfy. I can keep you happy. How fun is that? It's a nice place to be. Now we will do the Q&A at the end so you get out of here around 12, 15, 12, 20, but just so you know, at 12, 12 is when I'm officially shutting up. And that helps when you're trying to cope with people with the attention span of a gnat. By the way, if you want to break their attention span, if you want to make sure you have their attention, there's a little trick. You'll notice that a couple of times during the course of our conversation, I've dropped people's names. Now, Janice is on the call. And Janice right now is on high alert. Not because I've done anything mean to Janice, not because I've done anything to actually trouble Janice. But right now, Janice is on high alert because one, She's the only Janice on the call. And for two, she's afraid I'm actually going to call on her for something. I'm not Janice. But dropping your name all of a sudden put you on extremely high alert. She uh, actually chatted back with a little smile emoji. So yeah, or actually that's the laughing emoji. So, but that notwithstanding, you want to get somebody's attention on a conference call? Just say, so as we were saying, Greg, um, as soon as you say Greg, Greg's going to be like, huh, what, me? Janine, it's all about you. And Janine, suddenly, I have her attention. And it's funny because sometimes they'll actually rat themselves out. They will. 
they'll rat themselves out because they say, I'm sorry, did you ask me a question? No, no, I was just using you as an example. That's all. Why, did you have something you wanted to share? No, 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 don't, don't just. Uh... So dropping names, by the way, is a way to get people back in terms of their attention span. It's, it's one thing that you can do. Now we talked about this. Bottom line up front. If you look at Facebook or TikTok Reels, and they say, watch till the end. And you go all the way to the end and it's like, I didn't see anything. Where does that leave you? It leaves you angry. It does. It leaves you ticked off. Why are you ticked off? Because they baited you. That's a problem. We should never be that person. Also, we want to let people know that there's an avenue to gather any information they miss or to clarify something that is particular to them as early as is reasonable. Oh, that's my cell phone number. Really? You want to send me a text? You want to just talk about something? Fine. There you go. But if you tell people that early on, particularly in voicemail, geez, if you're leaving a voicemail, name, phone number, then whatever you wanted to tell them, name and phone number, so that if they have to go back and listen to it again, it starts with, hi, this is Carl, 301-606-6519. Then you can go ahead and check. Oh, and by the way, I just did my own fatal mistake. I assume they know which Carl this is. Granted, there aren't a lot of us, but still, Carl Pritchard. Let them know the full name of who you are so they can at least look you up on the web. If they just search for Carl, it's going to be a long day. And you get one day or one opportunity, one first moment in which to make any promises you're going to make. When I talk to Ed, told him, I said, well, the one thing I really need is just the money for that particular account. And Ed went right there. He was willing to accept my premise and give me a promise. It works both ways. Bottom line up front is one of the most powerful ways. And in the military, it's required thinking. It is. You have to present all of your presentations bottom line up front. Anytime you're communicating with others, the expectation is that you are going to actually communicate. Bottom line up front. Adjective. You know, we're the best at, oh, are you? Best is an adjective. The most is an adjective. Largest. Really? In what context? Effective, efficient, labor saving. What the devil do those even mean? Oh, we're, we're very efficient in our management practice. Really? Timely and time sensitive. Now, that's not my dog. I have a dog. But that's not my dog. Red color for my dog. My dog's name is Mocha. Yeah, gotta love Mocha. She's a chocolate labradoodle. How cool was that? Yeah. But what's interesting is when I say some adjectives like chocolate labradoodle, that's actually a classification and the adjective itself is defensible. You can defend calling her a chocolate labradoodle. Some of you have seen chocolate labs. Just put poodle fur on one of those. And there you've got her. That's my dog. Now, the worst adjective you can ever use. Unique. And the reason I say that is because is it truly one of a kind? Unique. And I, 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 I'm, I, I, I. It's an English major as well. And, and what was driving me crazy a lot of the times when people would say, we've got the most unique. There is no such thing as the most unique. It, it is binary. It's either unique or it's not. It's either one of a kind or it's not. Yeah, adjectives. 
you need to lose the adjectives, or at least when you're sending out an email, review your email for the adjectives. Just take a look through. Did you say anything that was descriptive in nature that wasn't absolutely positively provable and true? If you did, then erase it. Delete the adjective and see if it still makes sense. No, we are the most powerful. How about we are a powerful purveyor? Oh, powerful. There's another adjective. What makes you powerful? If that's defensible, then good. To call yourself most or best at anything? Wow. Unless somebody else has already made that declaration. Unless somebody else has said, you know what? Scott, you are the best of the best. It's got to be like, yes, yes, I am. Thank you. Best of the best. Well, who says? If you've got some incontrovertible proof, then fine. Otherwise, let it go. Lose the adjectives or at least review them before you go about just tossing them into your conversation. Bill Drenton, my journalism prof, the one who told me I'd never make it in radio. Because, and there's the quote from Drenton, your message needs the pipes to support it. So Carl, you just don't have a voice for radio. Wow. Thanks, Bill. I only made it to news director at a top 10 station in a top 10 market and did it before I was 25. Ah! But Bill Drenton was right. You do need the pipes to support it. When our kids were growing up, we were having Cub Scout meetings. And when we would ever have not just the den meeting, but the PAC meeting. And any of you who have been involved in scouting know that the PAC meeting is where all the dens get together. Yeah, the PAC meeting. So you're talking about dozens and dozens of kids who have not yet hit puberty. Which is chaos. It's generally speaking, just chaos. I was always the one that go, Carl, can you get control? And I'd go, okay, all right, everybody settle. Time to settle down because we are going to get down to business. And my voice carried enough in our, in our pack hall that we could actually get things done. You do need the pipes to support it. If you can't use your voice to control a room, let me give you some suggestions. First off, Recognize which range of your voice you're using. The upper range. When you're up here, you come across as tense. You come across as somebody who is urgent, freaked out. So there are very rare occasions where you want to be up here. Most of us talk in the middle range of our voice, and that's fine. But be aware. The mid-range of your voice. That's normal and unexciting. In fact, if you're on a conference call and you're running the conference call and you're going through slide after slide after slide, spreadsheet after spreadsheet after spreadsheet, and you're going through them and you're using your normal voice, we normally use 30% of our vo vocal range. If you do that for more than, oh, 10 minutes, every head bowed and every eye closed. You'll lose them in a heartbeat. Yeah. And the other component of this is the lower range of your voice down here. Most of us avoid this range and we shouldn't because it implies a degree of gravitas, seriousness. I mean what I say. And Albert Morabian was a communications theorist who said, 38% of all your messaging takes place through tone and voice. Your tone. How do you sound? How do you come across? Do you sound sincere? Now, a lot of us are afraid of and the number one fear, public speaking. And what's notable is you're running a meeting and you'll be like, so I, I think we all ought to get together. The, sorry. I think we all ought to, I think we should all get to uh, 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 one more time. And 
rather than just forging ahead. I think we should all just get together and uh, get together and just keep going. People don't really care if you trip over your tongue. The only person who notices is you. That's right, it's you. You're the one freaking out. You really are. Half the time, nobody notices. But if you put some noise into your message, everybody notices. Yeah, this, this cheap little headset I'm wearing is not cheap. No, it wasn't. It's a Plantronics. It's a nice high-end headset. And by the way, if you're looking for a brand name for a headset that actually has a good mic, I, I tend to have a lot of luck with Plantronics. But it's notable that some people, oh no, I'll just use the onboard mic on my computer. I'll go pop a car sounding like this. Well, I could go ahead and you actually be able to make out the words that I am saying. But you'd get frustrated in very short order. The clearer you can make your voice, the more effectively you can get your message across. And that's really kind of important. People don't realize how frustrating hiss is, how frustrating background noise is, how exhausting it is for the listener. And I do mean physically exhausting. Thanks, Karen. Appreciate that. And it is. It's one of those things where people don't realize that just spending a few extra bucks on a decent mic makes you come off as more authoritative. It does. It guarantees um, that you come off as a bit more authoritative. And as I said, for, for, my, for my money, I, I kind of settled on Plantronics. Plantronics. And you're going to find out, wow, those aren't cheap. No, they're not cheap. But by the same token, you, know, you can get a, a Sennheiser mic, which is lovely, but again, kind of on the pricey side. Um, as far as in the in the range of 100 bucks thereabouts or less, and I found Plantronics to be my best bet. And indeed, that's a road you want to go down. You do. It's it's it it's going to make everybody notice if you come across as well spoken and clear. People think, oh, you know, but I don't have that goofy headset thing working over my head. You know, your visual piece of this can handle that a lot better than you could handle hiss, background noise, or muddiness in my voice. Absolutely. When you're dealing with meetings, when you're trying to communicate, you want to sound like a journalist. And if you've noticed, some people in um, on the news these days, will actually do it over a Zoom call. And they'll sit there and, and it drives me crazy because this is a Zoom and my voice comes across, across nice and crystal clear. Why? Because I've got a good mic. If nothing else, at least test the record function on your computer, record yourself talking for a minute on your onboard mic and play it back and ask yourself, could I listen to that for a 45 minute meeting? If your answer is yes, then you probably have a really great onboard mic. But if it's no, it's time to invest in something that will make you come across it. It's just a wee bit more authoritative. Just a little bit. Now on to the basics of, well, journalism. Who, what, when, where, why, and how. And, huh? And these are the basic questions of journalism the ones that everybody's supposed to ask and, oh yeah, answer. It's what we're supposed to answer. It's why clickbait works so well, by the way. It's why you will click on some of those messages that are there just because it's like, I, I've got to know the background behind this story. I really do. And then you click and you'll find out, oh, it's not a story about this particular Karen or Ken. Yeah. No, it's, uh, it's something entirely different. But that's what you're going for. And it is your own natural need to investigate. Notice it's who, what, when, where, why, and how. But the first question is why? Why? 
Why are we here? Now, some of you came here for the PDU, and I'm good with that. I really am. I respect that. I just got renewed. Yeah. So I'll be renewing my PMP in 2026. Oh, yes. Yeah, I got time. But, and by the way, you're in the right place to renew PDUs. This is the, I was down to the bitter end of getting my PDUs. And I was like, oh, crap. I need four more. And uh, where did I go? I went to IPMPI. My home away from home was sucking up PDUs. But the first question is, why are you here? And you expect an outcome for every communication, even with, heaven forbid, your significant other. That's right. He or she actually wants to know, why are they communicating with you? And it's interesting because I raised some suggestions to my wife recently. She said, are you trying to plan a date? Spoiler. Yeah. And actually I was. We've only been married 39 years. You got to keep things going. But what's notable is, do you actually? (laughs) Wow. I'll get to that in a second. One of the things on chat just popped up. But you're communicating for a reason, and the other parties want to know what's the reason. And I want to thank DC for the comment, more so in the right place to hear a quality speaker and educator on project management topics. Excuse me, I'm missing. It's a lovely answer. Yeah, the first question is why? And the reason is because you'll get something better. Randy England and Alfonso Bucero, two friends of mine. They're also instructors, and they're very good instructors. And every time you meet Alfonso and Randy for the first time, they'll say, and Randy will always be the one who starts, he'll say, today is a great day. You know, oddly enough, that's his premise as for why you're communicating with him. You want affirmation that today is a great day. I love talking to him. Alfonso, his partner, actually says, And tomorrow will be even better. These are people you want to hang around with. Why do you want to hang around with them? Because they're sharing a positive message. That's that's it. You know, why are they communicating with you? To make you feel better about your career, about yourself, about the world around you. Oh, my gosh. These are guys you want to hang with. Why is the first question. Why are we getting together? That's the one that actually matters. Now, back to the basic journalism question. Who? Who are you? Who is your recipient? Who is the recipient of your deliverable? Wow. Who are you? You know, most of you know that I'm a project management geek of the highest order. By the way, I was named best of the best by PMI Global. (laughs) You have to love that. Yeah, I actually can qualify my adjective. But some of you didn't know I was a member of the media, a a, a bona fide member of the media. See that there. Let me move the camera just a little. There. That's it. There we go. Yeah. That is my, and if you're wondering who's who's the guy on on the, that thing. This is a, Congressional press pass from 1987. And yeah, that's me on the congressional press pass. Yeah, I used to, yeah, oh yeah. Who am I? I'm a journalist by trade and by education. Yeah, the whole project management thing was completely accidental. I had I had no designs or desire to be here. And then, you know, 30 years later, I'm I've been a project manager now for 30 years. Kind of, oh, that makes a bit of a difference. It gives you a little different perspective. Who am I? I'm a project management geek of the highest order, but I'm also a journalist by trade. You love finding out who people are. People have past lives. Ask them. Find out your audience's past life. I mean, you are not folks who have always been project managers. I'm willing to lay hard money that many of you have kind of a bizarre career path that got you here. 
And if you want to go ahead and share what you were in a past life, drop it in the chat. Because it's always kind of interesting to understand that these are not all project management professionals who've always been embraced by the Project Management Institute. No, we all have different lives. So go ahead, take a second if you would, and in the chat interface on Zoom, go ahead and drop in some of your past lives. What have you been in your past existence? Baker, substitute teacher, communications specialist. Ooh, Baker. Yeah, I'm that too. Lab tech. There's a fun one. I was a casino blackjack dealer for a couple of years. It gets better. Yeah. Soccer coach, compliance manager, accordion teacher. Oh, wow. I'm in love with you, David. That's, that's a great answer. Baseball coach, business analyst, serving food at an amusement park. Yeah, I've had every food job you could ever imagine. Oh, David, can you teach me? Someone wants to learn the accordion. That is just, she wants to be Weird Al. Um, dishwasher, fast food, ski salesman, ski bum, drafter, engineer and tech. And yet here we all are. Wow. Why? Who? It's important to know this stuff about people. It's nice to know that Markin was a ski bum. Yeah. Why? Because if you're a skier, then you can start sharing your war stories. You have background. You have something that's vital to effective communications, and that's context. You want to have a bad communications event. Share no context with the other people in the room. Yeah. yeah if we have no context together, we have nothing to talk about. This is why people talk about the weather. What? Common context. Here in lovely Cumberland, Maryland. Oh, there you go. Marine biologist, entry-level programmer trainee, associate engineer, information technology, and ultimately an IT project manager. Now, I live in far western boondocks, Maryland. And I'm staring at a gray, cloudy day outside my window. Some of you are staring at gorgeous sunshine. And I don't want to hear about it. No. But the fact of the matter is we have context. Weather gives us context. Sports teams give us context. When you're finding out something about who people are, find out just, well, who they were. Yeah, find out what their yesterday was. And if you're looking into the crystal ball, if you're, <laughs> DC said, lovely Florida is sunny. Yeah. So, but ask the question, who are they going to be tomorrow using your project, using the outputs from your project? How are you giving them a better day? Yeah. If you understand where people are coming from, it's, it's amazing how you can have a higher level of context and better communications if you have that common understanding. Terms that were commonplace 50 or 100 years ago, there are things that they said back then that we would never say today. And they'd be totally misconstrued. They would be. They would be completely and utterly misconstrued if you use them today. It's amazing. Just think of where we've come in the past years, not hundred years, excuse me, not hundreds of years, but five years, 10 years. Things that are acceptable, are no longer acceptable. Terms that were used, terms that have been invented. 15 years ago, nobody had ever heard of fat shaming. And as somebody who's lost 100 pounds in the past six years, I understand what that whole term means. But now you look at this and you look at the whole notion of, gee, fat shaming. We all know what it is. We understand where it's coming from. We understand who's being taken to task on that. We know all of those things. Terms get misconstrued. We have to be careful when we're communicating. Are we using the right words? And when it comes to asking what people are going to get out, go ahead and tell them where they're going. 
Tell them, when we're done here, here's how your systems are going to be different. When we're done here, here's how your environment is going to be different. When we're done here, talk about the outcomes. Talk about what's happening. I've already told you. 12, 12. Some of you are looking at the clock. Okay, Carl, down to 18 minutes. Step it up. No, I'm in pretty good shape, actually. But you need to know the outcome. And the outcome is more than just a PDU. The outcome is, did you get anything you could use? Did you understand the notion of the inverted pyramid? Do you have some grasp on how important it is to drop someone's name? in the course of a conversation. Yeah, you know why your name is the thing that always snaps you to attention? It's the one thing you've been hearing since the day you were born. That's right. Not many things you can assure yourself that you were hearing the day you were born. But the day you were born, somebody looked at you. Somebody stared down into that beautiful little face. And they looked at you and they said, Sharish, Sushil. Oh, it's so good to see Rose. Oh, Rose. Yeah. Since the day you were born and as you were growing up, parents wanted to roust you out of bed. Pretty darn simple mission. Robin. Ah! Yeah. All they had to do was just chime in your name. As soon as they did, hop to, you were suddenly paying attention. Talk about the outcomes. When we're done here. That's a phrase I use a lot. I do. When we're done here. When I'm running a meeting, I love to use that phrase. When we're done here, here's what I hope you're going to walk away with. The reason being is that way I know I've structured my conversation in such a way that I know what the outcomes are supposed to be. All too often we, we go into a meeting, what am I talking about today? I have no idea. Well, crap. Oh, well, I'll wing it. Yeah, totally wrong answer. Instead, what we should be looking at is when we're done here and know what it is we're going to have when we're done here. When it matters. For some of you, knowing the 1212 is coming is the greatest comfort of all. Knowing that exactly at 1212, I'm to be done. When? If people know when things are going to happen, and when, by the way, is one where you should act like a journalist. Somebody says, um, yes, please hold. Someone will be with you in a moment. Excuse me. I'm sorry. How long a moment? How long a moment? If, and whenever I'm talking to a real human being, if they say, can I put you on hold for a minute? That's it. A minute or several minutes? And, and they're always like, um, well, it could take longer than a minute. I said, okay, so let's split the middle and call it three minutes. Right now I have 11.57 by my clock at 12 noon. That's when you're going to pick the phone back up. Yeah, I'll check back in with you even if I don't have an answer. Good enough. And sure enough, it changes my comfort zone as the recipient of information on a, on, a, uh, on a call, like a help desk call. There's nothing more powerful than actually controlling the clock. You control the clock if you ask the when question. You get to leverage that question. Now also ask yourself the question, is this something that will stand the test of time? Is it something that will hold up? I, I love the fact that they update the PMBOK the guide to the project management body of knowledge. And the reason I like that they update it is because it gives us fresh context. Yeah. Pimbach One doesn't even acknowledge there is such a thing as Agile. I have a copy, by the way. I'm one of the few people on the planet who actually has the first Pimbach. Yeah. Oh, yeah. Three ring binder, no less. A lot skinnier. The current, but you read through this, and some of this you're like, that is so antiquated, that is so out of date. No, which is why we have to let people know our message is for today, or 
This is a message I want you to carry forth through the ages. Now, oddly enough, Johannes Gutenberg came up with what is basically inverted pyramid style writing. That was in the 1400s. And it still plays rather nicely here in 2023. I find that incredible. So when does matter? And where? I told you I'm in Western Maryland. Yeah, Western Maryland, like boondocks Maryland. I used to live just outside DC. I used to make the commute into Washington DC every day. And now I'm in the boondocks. I live on top of Haystack Mountain. Mm -hmm. I live on a ridge on Haystack Mountain, nice little house. Up on top of Haystack Mountain, nice little street. It's a neighborhood, even though it's on top of a mountain, it's a neighborhood. And what's, what's interesting is there's no place to go from here. Yeah, you can either go down the mountain on the roads or down the mountain down the hill. That's pretty much it. You drop anything in my yard and it's rolling down. Yeah, that's where you're going. Some of you have context with this. You do. And quite frankly, excuse me for You do, and what you don't realize is context actually matters. There's a television show from Canadian TV, CTV, that was called Corner Gas. It's a sitcom. And the interesting thing about this particular, particular situation comedy is that, well, quite frankly, it's rooted in where. The comedy is set in Dog River, Saskatchewan. Dog River is a podunk, podunk town. I grew up in a podunk town, Columbiana, Ohio. Yeah. And the interesting thing about Dog River and the show Corner Gas, the interesting part about that, part about that is that people who are watching Corner Gas, and I've asked people this before when I've been teaching up in Canada, I, I've, I've said, do you like corner gas? And it's funny. The answers are binary. Yes, no. There's no, eh, no, 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 no. No, people either like it or they don't. And the interesting thing is the people who like it are people who were born and raised in the boondocks. Because it's got a very Andy Griffith kind of feel. It's Andy Griffith meets Seinfeld. It's, it's weird that way. But what makes it compelling is the fact that people who were born and raised in a small town or people who spent any significant time in a small town, they watch that show and they find it tear-inducing funny. They really do. They just roar over corner gas. And, and the thing that makes that so intriguing is it's all about the where. Where is this all happening? Do you know where you are? Do you? Do you know where you are? Seriously, that seems like just a reasonable place to be asking. I tell people I'm a Buckeye. Wow. And people immediately assume I'm from Columbus. No, I'm from a map dot along the edge of Ohio near Pittsburgh. But Cleveland's a whole different story from Columbus. PMIRMP. Are you a PMI RMP? Good, then you should be able to speak the risk language. The guy I used to work with, Ben. Ben was in the Bible Belt teaching a class, project management class. Ben had a nasty vocal foible. And that was, he'd say, well, God, you know, there's no other reason for doing this except, oh God, if they booted him out after two days, why? He's taking the Lord's name in vain. Something you do not do in the Bible, Belt. Note to self. Yeah, you need to know where you are and you need to know how your message is being conveyed. How? It's a mechanics question. How do you do that? It goes to not tacit knowledge, but it goes to explicit knowledge. Knowledge that can be shared. It's the mechanic. How do you do that? No. If you can actually answer that question, 
in a quantitative way, if you can do it with rules and steps and uh, protocols, then you've answered the mechanics question. How do you do that? Never leave that out when you're having a conversation. If you're trying to get somebody to do something, tell them how they're going to do it. That picture, that somewhat warped fisheye lens picture is my wall. I started building that when we moved up here to the boondocks three years ago. I just finished it this year, this past year, 2022. I built that whole wall by myself. How? If you're wondering, there's the YouTube. Yeah, that's where I went. That's where I went to figure that out. If you can put it in a YouTube, you can answer the how question. People don't want to need you. I was thrilled when I found a YouTube and I didn't have to go asking anybody, how do you build a rock wall? I went to YouTube. They warned me. They said, if you build this poorly, it will probably only last 900 to 1,000 years. If you build it well, some are still in existence from the Paleolithic, some dating back more than 10,000 years. So I figure I'm probably pretty secure for the next 40. Yeah, I'm thinking I'm safe. The how question is something we should be answering. Huh? Now, this is not part of the normal journalism list, but huh? It is a basic question. Give people the opportunity to turn it into a two-sided conversation. Even if you're just forcing it, even if you're just asking, okay, fine, what other jobs have you had? Oh, that's how you do that. Yeah. The reason being is you want to open the door for conversation. You want to accept the fact that you're not knowing all and seeing all. That there's actually some place where you might have left something wide open that somebody desperately needed to know or to hear. They don't want to need you. People really don't. People don't want to need you. We, are, by contrast, actually want to be needed. Most people do want to be needed. And that's why that open door is so important. I love people who have an open door policy and then close their doors. But that's why we have a million different forms of communication right now. For some reason, my email has been thrown to every Gmail spam box there is. I, I, I found my, I, I'm living in Gmail heck. I really am. And, and it's driving me crazy. And what's notable is I'm, I'm suffering the huh problem. So what I found is um, Facebook Messenger works. LinkedIn messaging works. And my alternate email, which is an att.net account that I've had since the dawn of email, it's, it generally works. But I find other ways to communicate. I gave you my phone number at the outset of all this. The whole idea is to keep that door open. Any effective communication, and this is something that I think some of the best journalistic practice of the modern day really plays into. The newspapers, the be albeit online, but those web entities that are sharing news that actually provide the author's email address conduct a huge public service because they're doing this step. They're leaving the door open. Hey, I got a couple of questions here. Do you even remember what the inverted pyramid was? Yeah, big stuff up front. More value, more value, more value, more value all the way down. Yeah, I reminded you of this. Why? Because I think it's the most important thing you can walk away with today. But there are other things to walk away with and to check your communications for. These are them. These are five words to check how you're using an email. You. You might think you. Well, that's a word I use all the time. You. You need to. You ought to. We should. You. By the way, you. You points an accusatory finger. It does. Limit. I'm not saying abolish, but limit the use of the word you, unless it is something where you're actually talking about something that that particular individual has control of. 
more they have control over whatever the topic might be, you becomes more appropriate. But otherwise, double check your use of the word you. And that does not mean we default to we. We all not amused. Yeah, well, maybe we are. I am always amused. But the point being that we is a dangerous phrase because when I say Susan and I, we care deeply about, and Susan's sitting there going, you know, there are a lot of things in my life I don't care deeply. Yeah, but that's yet another one that actually has, well, some mileage on it. Be careful about we. Be careful about how many times you say I or we. I, 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 oh, for crying out loud, drop it. The world is not an ego check. Careful about words like Catholic. Now, most of you, when I say Catholic, you're imagining or envisioning the Pope. You're imagining a big church. Catholic is actually a term in the English language that predates, hard to believe anything predates, predates the use of the word Catholic to describe the Catholic Church. The Catholic Church, actually Catholic as it's translated into plain English is universal. Catholic is a synonym for universal. Oh, so when you say, you know, when we're looking at, when we're looking for Catholic truths, we're looking for universal truths. We're not looking for word on high from the Pope. I never knew that. Yeah, so if you see it with lowercase c, it makes all the difference in the world. And beware the always and nevers. And you like the label I put up there? Hand wash on. It's at least one of you who has violated that rule. It says hand wash only. It's a lie. Yeah. Yeah, some of you are like, oh, no, no, I put it in the gentle cycle, I toss it in a little bag, and I throw it in the wash. Yeah. Be, be careful about what you assume is basically how a message is going to be received, and then ultimately apply. When you're looking, at these messages. Just check your, yourself at the door and take a moment and check for these words. And I challenge you to actually just go ahead and use, try the you example, and just keep an eye on how frequently you're using the word you, because it can be a threat in some people's minds. The open door, there I am, that's my email address, pretty easy to remember, carl at Carl Pritchard. Dot com. And that's my phone number. Also note one other thing I've done here. I've given you my response time for email. 24 hours. If it didn't make it there in 24 hours, I'm in your spam folder. Yeah, I really genuinely am. That's where I, that's where I reside. It's home sweet home for me. But expect a 24-hour response. And if you don't get one, please just Check your spam folder, and if it's not there, pop me the email again, because somehow it got lost in the internet. I will always get back to you in 24 hours. Can you talk about, about applying inverted pyramid when answering questions, specifically thinking about answering questions posed by executives during presentations? When the big cheese, the big honcho, uh, drops a question on you mid-presentation, what you, and it's really tempting just to, just to blurt out whatever you can at that moment and look like, hey, I'm Einstein. I know that right off the, the tip of my head to say, can you give me just a few seconds? I want to put together a cogent answer for you. You know, not jumping into our first instinct answer is one way of actually getting to apply the, the inverted pyramid. And it gives you a chance to kind of quickly order your ideas. And if you think about, okay, end game, end game, what does she want? You know, this big honcho executive, you're trying to figure it out. What does she want to hear? Then you could actually take that 30 seconds, say, I, I am going to need 30 seconds just to come up with a really cogent response. 30 seconds is forever. But at the same time, it makes you appear thoughtful. And it gives you a chance to actually rank order what you're going to say in response or to actually recognize this is a huge question that could burn my entire career. And maybe, just maybe, I want to say, you know what? Coming up with an honest answer to that would take a little more time than I think we have prescribed in the meeting. If you can just give me till uh, close of business, 
I'd love to put something more intelligent together for you. So I think that's what you want to hear. Carl, very, very special thank you to you and for presenting with us today. Thanks.